Welcome to the mythical astronomy of ice and fire. King Bran, Part 2. Return of the Summer King. Hello there, friends. LML here, in loyal service to his weirwooden majesty, King Brandon Stark, called the Broken, first of his name, Lord of the Andals, the Roinar, and the First Men, and the Direwolves, and the Ravens, and the Little Bloodthirsty Forest Elves. We're off to a great start in our quest to understand what the book version of King Bran will look like. He's going to be a powerful Green Seer King, and to help defeat the others, he's going to have to tap into his terrifying magical abilities quite a bit more than what we saw on the show. But on a larger scale, what Bran and the forces of the living are seeking to defeat is actually the Long Night, an unnatural winter. He's seeking to make the seasons turn again after they've become stuck, which is the traditional role of the folkloric Green Man. Indeed, when we search back through the five books of A Song of Ice and Fire and look for that sweet, sweet King Bran foreshadowing, as everyone is these days, we find that George conceives of Bran not only as a Green Seer King, but as a Summer King in the Oak King, Holly King tradition. In fact, the very first king of Westeros, Garth the Green, was crafted as the absolute epitome of a summer oak king. And the first king in the main story of A Song of Ice and Fire, well, he's a summer oak king too, Robert Baratheon, who's actually modeled after Garth the Green. As we're going to see today, Bran's ascension to the throne as a new summer king will amount to a completion of the cycle of the seasons in our story, a return to where it all began, summer. This video podcast is brought to you by the faithful and generous support of the Mythical Astronomy Patreon community, who make all of this possible. Please check out LucifermeansLightbringer.com to find out how to support the show, or to find the matching text to this and all of our other podcasts. If you like the video, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and most of all, share it with your friends. It really helps. All right, folks, it's Garth time. Garth the Green is Westeros' version of the ubiquitous Green Man of European folklore, and he's regarded as the most ancient legendary figure of the First Men. He's actually called the, quote, First King and the High King of the First Men, and he may have even been the one to lead the First Men across the Arm of Dorne into Westeros. There's a lot to be said about Garth, and I've said a lot about him in many podcasts, but we aren't going to do a full breakdown of all the Garth lore today. Rather, I want to specifically highlight the evidence that he and or his offspring may have been Green Seer Kings, both simply to continue to prove that Green Seer Kings were a thing, and more specifically, to dig up some more juicy King Bran foreshadowing. First off, as many of you know, George borrowed quite heavily from various Green Man and Horned Nature God folklore from the real world when he fashioned his Garth the Green legend. And these types of Green Nature Gods pretty much always act as protectors of the woods and of nature as a whole, and they're often depicted as communing and communicating with animals. Consider the famous Gunderstrap Cauldron, which seems to be the earliest appearance of Old Sir Nunos. You can see all the cute little forest animals gathered around him there, ready to eat clover from his hands, or perhaps to eviscerate the bowels of his enemies, whichever is warranted. In many traditions, the Horned God is even regarded as an avatar or an embodiment of the primal forces of nature and the wood itself. So really, the idea of skin changing and green seeing, joining your spirit with animals and trees, seems like exactly the sort of power that a green man like Garth should have. Next up is the fact that the description of Garth the Green and the description of the Sacred Order of Green Men who guard the Weirwoods on the Isle of Faces are more or less identical. According to Old Nan's tales, as relayed to us by Bran, the Green Men ride on elks, and sometimes they have antlers too. Compare that to what we hear about Garth. Some stories say he had green hands, green hair, or green skin overall. A few even give him antlers, like a stag. That's pretty similar so far. Garth basically sounds like a lost member of the Order of the Green Men, and the Green Men guard weirwoods. Garth the Green is regarded as a god, or god-man, and he's tied to the old gods specifically. Legend states that Garth planted three intertwining weirwoods, called the Three Singers, at the center of the god's wood at Highgarden, which he also founded. Planting weirwoods is typically something you'd expect from a child of the forest, those who sing the Song of Earth, or at least from one who is intimately familiar with weirwoods, like a green seer or caretaker of weirwoods of some sort. As for those green men, Bran says that all the tales agreed that the green men had strange magic powers, and it's very likely that those are green seer and weirwood powers. For one, you can't ride an elk without magic. It's just not possible. This is one of the reasons that I believe cold hands might be a resurrected skin changer or green seer. 
just as Jon Snow will soon be a resurrected skin changer. And although that's a tale for another day, the point is obvious. There is no way to tame and ride a ten-foot-tall-at-the-shoulder great elk without magic. They just aren't tameable animals. More to the point, the Green Men are explicitly tied to the Weirwoods, as we know. Quoting Maester Lewin from A Game of Thrones. So the gods might bear witness to the signing, every tree on the island was given a face, and afterward the sacred order of green men was formed to keep watch over the Isle of Faces. It seems likely that the strange magic powers of these green men would be tied to the weirwoods that they guard, right? To put it even more simply, we have on one hand a green-skinned, antlered man named Garth the Green planting weirwoods, and on the other, we have antlered green men guarding the most important weirwoods in Westeros. They both look like classic horned green nature gods, who are in turn known for protecting the woods and talking to animals, and maybe just a wee bit of human sacrifice. Although the sacred order of green men were not kings, Garth the Green certainly was. As I said, he's widely remembered and titled as the, quote, first king of Westeros, who established the longest running line of kings in Westerosi history, those of House Gardner. A green-skinned, weirwood-planting king of Westeros. And not just any king, but the very first king. Ergo, if Bran becomes a weirwood king of all of Westeros, one could say that he's actually following most closely in the footsteps of old Garth the Green himself. George would most likely conceive of ending the story with a green seer king like Bran on the throne of Westeros as a return to roots, as bringing it all back around to where it started. As we mentioned last time, there's also a legend in the Riverlands of a green king of the god's eye, which could be a mangled legend of Garth himself, who certainly makes sense as a king of the green men, as you can see. Or perhaps this is a memory of some green seer who tried to set himself up as a king, drawing on his magic powers and the reputation of the green men. Either way, what I see going on here is George subtly planting an image in the reader's mind of a green king of the Weirwoods, a green seer king who rules with the powers of the old gods. In the last video, we talked about how Bran declares himself Prince of the Green, Prince of the Wolfswood, and Prince of the Woods when he's warging into summer and exulting in his wolfish power. Princes of the Green must grow up to be kings of the Green, and so there is your foreshadowing. Bran's destiny may be to be a green king of the old gods, a wolfish king of the wood instead of a wolfish prince of the wood. Even better, there's a halfway decent chance that Bran will be a green seer king who actually goes to the Isle of Faces. As we've discussed a few times, it's absolutely possible that the books will have the Isle of Faces playing a part in the White Walker Endgame showdown, as opposed to everything happening exclusively at Winterfell. It could be the place that the White Walkers want to reach in order to well and truly freeze over Westeros, if you will, if indeed they have the same hatred for the Green Seers that they do on the show. And what about all that delicious Weirwood Net shutdown foreshadowing that we found in the End of Ice and Fire series? That may come to a head on the astral plane, but if there's a physical location where such a shutdown occurs, one of the best candidates would be the Isle of Faces, of course. Any way you slice it, Bran is the one person in the story who consistently thinks about and brings up the green men, so if anyone is going there, it's probably Bran. Consider this line from A Storm of Swords, which comes after Jojen and Mira have just told Bran the story of the Knight of the Laughing Tree, which includes their father Howland Reed paddling out to the Isle of Faces in a little boat to meet the green men. Bran thinks to himself, The day was growing old by then, and long shadows were creeping down the mountainsides to send black fingers through the pines. If the little Cranog man could visit the Isle of Faces, maybe I could too. All the tales agreed that the Green Men had strange magic powers. Will Bran go to the Isle of Faces? George has said that it will figure into the end of the story, and as you can see, Bran seems to be the right guy to interface with all the Weirwoods and Green Men there. If King's Landing does end up in ruins, which I think is very possible, perhaps it could even make sense for Bran to be crowned king on the Isle of Faces, making him a green king of the god's eye in a more literal fashion. At the very least, I'm expecting George to find more creative ways to tie Bran's kingship back to Garth and the Green Men whenever and wherever he is crowned, so be on the lookout for that. Whatever happens, it seems that we're going to see the Isle of Faces before the story is over, and Bran will surely be involved. Another strong clue that Garth the Green should be associated with green seeing and skin changing is the fact that several of his offspring sound a lot like skin changers. One is outright labeled as a skin changer, and that would be... 
Rose of Red Lake, a skin changer, able to transform into a crane at will. A power some say still manifests from time to time in the women of House Crane, her descendants. Technically, if Rose was a skin changer, then she would have been inhabiting the flesh of cranes or other animals, as opposed to transforming into them. But this seems like the typical sort of confusion that happens over time with folklore and fable. As from the non-magician's perspective, there's really not a big difference between a sorcerer who can change into an animal versus one who can inhabit their minds and control them. Bottom line, wizards are attacking you with animals. And the relevant point here is that Garth's daughter Rose is outright labeled as a skin changer. And history seems to confirm this, as some descendants of House Crane have reportedly manifested the gift from time to time. Rose's brother also had a suspicious animal transformation. He was... Bors the Breaker, who gained the strength of 20 men by drinking only bull's blood and founded House Bulwer of Black Crown. Some tales claim Bors drank so much bull's blood, he grew a pair of shiny black horns. Just as with Rose of Red Lake, what I think we're really talking about here is a confused tale of a man inhabiting an animal's skin, a skin changer. Those horns also make Bors a sort of horned lord figure, like his daddy Garth. And of course, the real-world folklore George is riffing off of here includes both people with stag antlers, as well as people with animal horns, like that of a bull, goat, or ram. Even the blood-drinking part of the Boar's legend sounds like it could be skin-changer activity. Vermeer Sixkins ate the heart of some of the foes he killed, perhaps believing it would make him stronger. So that sort of magical cannibalism thinking is potentially part of Green Seer and skin-changer culture. One certainly thinks of the tradition of sacrificing humans to heart trees, especially the one Bran saw in a vision where he could actually taste the blood of the sacrifice through the roots of the weirwood tree. And if Jojen paste theory is right, meaning if the weirwood paste that Bran ate to awaken his powers contained Jojen's blood or flesh, as is strongly hinted at, then Bran also drank blood or practiced cannibalism to come into his green seer power. I should also mention that the older tales of Garth the Green involve Garth demanding human sacrifice from his worshippers, which reminds me a lot of the tales of the Green Seers sacrificing either captive humans or their own offspring to the Weirwoods in order to bring down that nasty hammer of the waters. I mean, look, these are bleeding trees that we're talking about. They have bloody faces, leaves like bloody hands, and their bark looks like bone. They look like they're screaming most of the time. Of course, their history is drenched in blood and human sacrifice. Continuing right along with Garth's possible skin changer offspring, we have... Ellen Eversweet, the girl who loved honey so much, she sought out the king of bees in his vast mountain hive and made a pact with him to care for his children and his children's children for all time. Here again, we have what could be a confused account of skin changing. No, I'm not saying that Ellen was skin-changing bees, but rather that the idea that people can communicate with animals and even make packs with them may well stem from the very real phenomenon of skin-changing and green-seeing. Although, skin-changing bees would be a good way to spy on people, just saying. And actually, you could send swarms of bees into the little eye slits of all those armored andals and do pretty well. On a more thematic note, honey is frequently used to symbolize the food of the gods, which is just another version of the fire of the gods concept. And Ellen is obtaining it by climbing a mountain. So this tale has many of the hallmarks of the universal myth theme that we know well by now. Mankind questing for the power of the gods or challenging the heavens. Next up, we have the tale of Rowan Goldtree, which also makes use of the fire of the gods motif, and specifically in conjunction with people trees. Rowan Goldtree, who was so bereft when her lover left her for a rich rival that she wrapped an apple in her golden hair, planted it upon a hill, and grew a tree whose bark and leaves and fruit were gleaming yellow gold, and to whose daughters the Rowans of Golden Grove trace their roots. It's hard to know what to make of this myth in literal terms, but the symbolism here is very suggestive. The golden apple serves well as a food of the god symbol, and here we have a broken-hearted woman growing such a tree of the gods from a part of herself. This is highly evocative of everything that we think we know about Nissa Nissa, who seems to have been an elf woman whose sacrifice and merging with the weirwoods may have been the key to opening up the weirwood net to human green seers. At least that's my headcanon. And if you want to read more about that, check out the Weirwood Goddess and the Weirwood Compendium podcast series. The fact that Martin chose a rowan tree for this legend is another clue that he's actually talking about weirwoods here. As I mentioned in the Venus of the Woods podcast, which is part of that Weirwood Goddess series, the rowan tree is also called the mountain ash tree, 
although technically they are not related to ash trees. Symbolically, however, Martin has made good use of ash trees, mountain ash trees, and rowan trees, all three, to make reference to Yggdrasil, which is always thought of as a great ash tree. We know that the Weirwoods are largely modeled after Yggdrasil, so what we have here is a legend about a woman's sacrifice and a magical tree that kind of sounds like a Weirwood tree, and about mankind obtaining the food and fire of the gods. Again, this is all a symbolic interpretation, but it does all point to Weirwood magic, and this is a legend about a daughter of Garth. Next up, we have a son of Garth. John the Oak, the first knight, who brought chivalry to Westeros. A huge man, all agree, eight feet tall in some tales, ten or twelve feet tall in others, sired by Garth Greenhand on a giantess. His own descendants became the Oak Hearts of Old Oak. This legend doesn't make anyone a skin changer, but it does show you that Garth was, you know, open-minded. Human woman, giantess, child of the forest woman, Garth's fertility knew no bounds, apparently. But hey, don't forget, Garth is sometimes said to have been the very first man in Westeros, so he may have had very little choice but to broaden his horizons. This is also yet another presentation of the people tree idea. John the Oak kind of sounds like someone named their oak tree John. Honey, John the Oak is dropping leaves all over the lawn again. Will you go rake it for me, please? <laughs> yeah. The name of the house that John the Oak founded, Oakheart, implies a tree with a heart, or perhaps a wooden heart, and that of course reminds us of heart trees. And finally, rounding out the possible skin changer activity amongst the children of Garth the Green, we have Brandon of the Bloody Blade, who drove the giants from the Reach and warred against the children of the forest, slaying so many at Blue Lake that it has been known as Red Lake ever since. As I mentioned last time, some tales also have Brandon of the Bloody Blade as a likely ancestor of Brandon the Builder. And the symbolism here implies that Brandon Bloody Blade may have actually been impregnating children of the forest as opposed to warring on them. The operative symbolism here, which is spelled out by Barbary Dustin in A Dance with the Dragons when talking about Bran's uncle Brandon Stark, Ned's brother, is that an impregnating penis can be seen as a bloody blade. Don't blame me, it's right in the books. Taken together with the idea that a child of the forest woman is very likely to die giving birth to a human baby, Brandon of the Bloody Blade may have been both impregnating and killing children of the forest here at Red Lake. Which, by the way, is a place where we already have confirmed skin changer activity via Rose of Red Lake. Ergo, Brandon of the Bloody Blade himself may not have been a human-child hybrid, but he may have sired a few of them, and they may have even been proto-Starks after a fashion. So, we have Rose of Red Lank, for sure, or at least outright stated as a skin changer, and we have a few other offspring with more subtle clues about skin changing and green seeing. Was Garth the Green the one whose genes had the gift? Or was it the women he copulated with, who may have been of different humanoid species, like giants or children of the forest? Either alternative is interesting, but I think the most straightforward explanation of all these fables is that it all starts with Garth. Green men do exist, or used to. They're green seers, and Garth was one of them who made himself a king and who founded many great houses. Perhaps there were other green men who became king, or maybe it was just Garth and his descendants. But what I see here is that the first king of Westeros was a green seer king, and it seems almost certain that the last king of Westeros that we'll ever read about will be one too. There's another intriguing piece to the Garth the Green Green Seer puzzle, and that's the fabled Oaken Seat, the living wooden throne upon which the ruling kings of the Reach from House Gardener always sat their royal behinds. It's not a weir wooden throne, but it is a wooden throne, and a living one at that. The World of Ice and Fire tells us that No petty king could ever hope to rival the power of Highgarden, where Garth the Gardener's descendants sat upon a living throne, the Oaken Seat, that grew from an oak that Garth Greenhand himself had planted. Now if this were a living Weirwood throne, we'd all have no doubt about what was going on here. The descendants of the Green Man King sit on a Weirwood throne, of course! They're Greenseer kings! But it's not Weirwood, it's Oak, so what's going on here? There's actually some really cool Green Man mythology at play here, that of the Oak King and the Holly King, which I think helps make sense of this. And please check out the Sacred Order of Green Zombies podcast series for the full breakdown on this. The gist of it is that this mythology is all about the turning of the seasons, with the horned green nature god sometimes split into two halves, an oak king to represent the summer, and the holly king to represent the winter, with the two kings supplanting one another every six months to mimic the cycle of the seasons. In A Song of Ice and Fire, George seems to have replaced the holly tree with the weirwood tree as the tree of the winter king, 
And one of the big clues about this, besides weirwoods almost exclusively being found in the north, is that the Holly King is, in fact, often called the Winter King. And in A Song of Ice and Fire, the Kings of Winter worship the weirwoods. On the other hand, Garth the Green, House Gardener, and everything from the Reach tends to exemplify summer. And so George has outfitted the legends and figures from the Reach in Oaken Summer King symbolism, including several of those children of Garth who are associated with the oak tree. The relevant point for A Song of Ice and Fire is that if there is one tree besides the Weirwoods, which should be seen as a magical tree, if there's one tree that the Greenseers might be able to use besides Weirwood trees, it's the oak tree. For example, Bloodraven uses the concept of the acorn and the oak remembering one another as a metaphor for the way that Weirwoods stand outside of time, which does kind of make you wonder. The heart tree at King's Landing, which Ned, Sansa, and Arya pray to all night in a Game of Thrones, is an oak tree instead of a weirwood, complete with a carved face, which kind of sends the message that, hey, if you don't have a weirwood available, an oak is the next best thing. When the wildlings come south of the wall in a dance with dragons, they carve faces in three different trees on the way to Molestown. The third one is an oak, and it sounds a bit like a tree ant from The Lord of the Rings. Just north of Molestown, they came upon the third watcher, carved into a huge oak that marked the village perimeter, its deep eyes fixed upon the King's Road. That is not a friendly face, Jon Snow reflected. The faces that the First Men and the Children of the Forest had carved into the Weirwoods in Eon's past had stern or savage visages more often than not. But the Great Oak looked especially angry, as if it were about to tear its roots from the earth and come roaring after them. I won't belabor the point. We don't know exactly what is up with the Oaken Seat, but it is a living tree throne set upon by the very oldest kings of Westeros, and according to legend, it was planted by someone who also planted weirwoods, and who was in all likelihood the very first green seer king of Westeros. It's just kind of hard for me to believe that this tale of a living tree throne planted by a green man king has nothing to do with green seers and their magic, even though it's made of oak and not weirwood. Now, when we examine the inglorious end of the Oaken Seat, which came at the conclusion of the 89-year reign of Garth the Tenth Gardener, the Greybeard, we find some potential Song of Ice and Fire endgame foreshadowing. One Dornish king besieged Old Town, whilst another crossed the Mander and sacked Highgarden. The Oaken Seat, the living throne that had been the pride of House Gardener for years beyond count, was chopped to pieces and burned, and the senile King Garth X was found tied to his bed, whimpering and covered in his own filth. The Dornish cut his throat, a mercy, one of them said later, then put Highgarden to the torch after stripping it of all of its wealth. Aha, so the Oaken Seat and Highgarden itself was... burned, did you say? Very interesting. And even the idea of an old man Garth being tied to his bed has to remind us of Old Man Bloodraven, tied to his weirwood dreaming nest. The TV show gave us the White Walkers infiltrating Bloodraven's cave and putting him to the sword in his weirwood throne. So perhaps this passage about Garth Greybeard's death and the burning of the Oaken Seat is simply foreshadowing for the destruction of Bloodraven's weirwood cave and the potential burning of his tree. Of course, the burning of the Oaken Seat and all of Highgarden could be foreshadowing for a shutdown of the Weirwood Net, as I've been talking about for the last few videos. All right, we're all done partying on with Garth. Well, we're never really done partying with Garth, but still, it's time to bring the focus squarely back to King Bran and what his kingly role will be. Bran's destiny is to be a Green Seer King, absolutely. But Bran should also be seen as a Summer King inside of the Oak King, Holly King framework that we were just talking about. While his brother John exemplifies the King of Winter and Winter King vein of mythology, Bran's early chapters are peppered with declarations of his status as a sweet summer child, such as this legendary, truly epic quote from Old Nan in A Game of Thrones. Oh, my sweet summer child, Old Nan said quietly, What do you know of fear? Fear is for the winter, my little lord, when the snows fall a hundred feet deep and the ice wind comes howling out of the north. Fear is for the long night, when the sun hides its face for years at a time, and little children are born and live and die all in darkness, while the dire wolves grow gaunt and hungry and the white walkers move through the woods. Not only is Bran a summer child who stands in opposition to the White Walkers and their unnatural winter, he also names his wolf Summer, of course. This all-important scene is from a Game of Thrones, and it comes right after Bran wakes from his coma dream after finally having chosen to fly instead of die. 
And then there was movement beside the bed, and something landed lightly on his legs. He felt nothing. A pair of yellow eyes looked into his own, shining like the sun. The window was open, and it was cold in the room, but the warmth that came off the wolf enfolded him like a hot bath. His pup, Bran realized. Or was it? He was so big now. He reached out to pet him, his hand trembling like a leaf. Summer's eyes are like suns, and his warmth enfolds Bran in a hot bath, almost like a baptism. This is Bran's great awakening, or reawakening, and it's wrapped up in the language of summer. Notice, too, that all of the summer symbolism in the scene is channeled specifically through his wolf. And this informs us that Bran's destiny as a summer king and a warg king are really the same thing. And that's the same impression we got when we saw Bran give himself the Prince of the Wood and Prince of the Green nicknames while skin-changing Summer. Interestingly, Bran the reawakened Prince of the Green has a hand like a leaf in this scene, just as weirwood leaves look like hands, I suppose. Is our leafy Summer Prince turning into a tree already? Branch? Stark? Well, it's not literally true yet, but we know he will eventually wed the tree and see through its eyes. And Bran does actually get to rustle those hand-shaped leaves at Theon in A Dance with Dragons. A few chapters before Bran's awakening that we just quoted from, Jon came to visit comatose Bran, and it says that his skin stretched tight over bones like sticks, and that Bran looked half a leaf. There's a lot more to that line of symbolism, which you can check out in the Weirwood Compendium series of podcasts, but it should come as no surprise that Martin chooses to describe Bran with leafy tree language, like a classic green man, since he went and labeled him a summer prince of the greenwood, and all the rest. It especially makes sense to do so in the scene where Bran has just begun to awaken to his green seer powers, or in a scene where Bran lies comatose and dreaming of the three-eyed crow, who in turn is really another tree man with bones like sticks, just like Bran. Seated on his throne of roots in the great cavern, half corpse and half tree, Lord Brynden seemed less a man than some ghastly statue made of twisted wood, old bone, and rotted wool. And then a paragraph later, Bran thinks, one day I will be like him. But as you can see, even before we get to Blood Raven's cave, Martin seems to be showing us Bran's tree man greenseer destiny in these early scenes. And the point I want to make here is that it's all intertwined with his Summer King symbolism. Bran drifts in his coma, receives instruction from the three-eyed crow, opens his third eye and chooses to fly, then awakens to life and warmth and promptly names his wolf a Summer Wolf. So if Bran is a summer child with a summer wolf, destined to be a leafy summer king, what happens when he goes underground? Nighttime, right? That's actually not a joke, because of course ancient man sometimes did think of the sun as going underground at nighttime. And Martin actually has a lot of fun playing with this idea. George sketches out the very cool underground sun metaphor during one of John's wolf dreams in A Dance with the Dragons. Snow, the moon insisted. The white wolf ran from it, racing toward the cave of night where the sun had hidden, his breath frosting in the air. On starless nights, the great cliff was as black as stone, a darkness towering high above the wide world. But when the moon came out, it shimmered pale and icy as a frozen stream. The wolf's pelt was thick and shaggy, but when the wind blew along the ice, no fur could keep the chill out. On the other side, the wind was colder still, the wolf sensed. That was where his brother was, the gray brother who smelled of summer. Prince Bran and his wolf Summer do indeed go into a cave of night right as winter falls. A pitch black cave where Bloodraven tells him to embrace the darkness as mother's milk and all that. You'll notice that in this passage, John and Ghost think of Summer, who is not only named Summer but actually smells like Summer apparently, and about how Summer is trapped on the other side of a huge icy cliff. The sun is in a dark cave. Summer is behind an icy cliff. This is all a metaphor for the long night, of course. Bran and his wolf Summer go into the dark cave right as winter falls, and when they come out of the cave, it will be to confront the others and help end whatever new long night has fallen. Bran will be the emerging Summer King of Westeros. The sun will have returned to the land. Winter will be over. Nature gets its green back. And Bran will be the green king the land of Westeros needs to heal and recover. This all compares very well to the Garth the Green Green Man cycle, where the green god dies every autumn when the trees lose their leaves, only to be reborn with the coming of spring. Bran's going down into the well of the Night Fort and through the Black Gate Weirwood Mouth and then underground to Blood Raven's Cave, all spells out the sun's death journey through the Cave of Night, as well as the idea of green nature hibernating through the winter. And again, Bran goes underground right as winter falls. 
When Bran eventually re-emerges from the cave, it will be like the rebirth of the sun, as well as the rebirth of the green vitality of nature. And because the word Bran can refer to part of a cereal grain, and because Bran is always asked for his corn seed, we can even see Bran himself as a seed, planted underground, which is ready to bloom with the spring. Hatip Baal the Bard. Here is where we find Martin telling us what Bran's role is on the most fundamental level. To make the seasons turn, to make sure the dream of spring gives birth to a bountiful summer, which, coincidentally, is the same role of the very first king of Westeros, Garth the Green. From a mythical perspective, this is actually the only logical end to the story, because the big problem everyone has to solve is the Long Night, which is simply a freezing and stopping of the cycle of the seasons. It only stands to reason that we'll need various kinds of green men to get things unstuck and growing again. As I mentioned at the top, it's not only Dawn Age Westeros that begins its story with an antlered, stagman summer king. The main story of A Song of Ice and Fire does too. Robert Baratheon is no green seer, but he is most certainly a Garth the Green parallel and a Summer King figure. Nowhere is Robert spelled out more clearly as a Summer King than in his monologue to Ned about Summer in King's Landing, delivered to Ned within minutes of Robert's arrival at Winterfell. The winters are hard, Ned admitted, but the Starks will endure. We always have. You need to come south, Robert told him. You need a taste of summer before it flees. In Highgarden, there are fields of golden roses that stretch away as far as the eye can see. The fruits are so ripe they explode in your mouth. Melons, peaches, fire plums, you've never tasted such sweetness. You will see, I brought you some. Even at storm's end, with that good wind off the bay, the days are so hot you can barely move. And you ought to see the towns, Ned. Flowers everywhere, the markets bursting with food, the summer wines so cheap and so good that you can get drunk just breathing the air. Everyone is fat and drunk and rich. He laughed and slapped his own ample stomach with a thump. And the girls, Ned, he exclaimed, his eyes sparkling. I swear, women lose all modesty in the heat. They swim naked in the river right beneath the castle. Even in the streets, it's too damn hot for wool or fur, so they go around in these short gowns, silk if they have the silver and cotton if not. But it's all the same when they start sweating and the cloth sticks to their skin. They might as well be naked. The king laughed happily. Robert Baratheon had always been a man of huge appetites, a man who knew how to take his pleasures. If Garth the Green could give a monologue, this is pretty much what it would sound like. I have to think that the point of putting such an over-the-top summer king on the throne of Westeros to begin the story proper is to highlight the role that the cycle of the seasons plays in the story. Look at the journey the story takes. A Game of Thrones ends with the end of a long summer and the death of Robert the Summer King. The story tracks through fall and winter when summer kings lie underground, either in their graves or in a creepy weirwood cave full of bones. And this story will end with a dream of spring and a new summer king, thus bringing us back to where we started. I'm not sure if Bran will get a cool set of antler horns, I get mine at the Halloween store if anyone's curious, but I think it's no coincidence that Martin made both the first king in our main story, as well as the vaunted first king of Westeros, Stagman Summer Kings. It's a message about where the story begins, and thus where the cycle must return to at the end. The return of the Summer King is what Bran's kingship is really about on a mythical level. The Clash of Kings brings us a marvelous chapter in which Bran's Summer King and Green Seer King roles are spelled out in symbolic, even ritualistic fashion. It's the Harvest Feast at Winterfell. This is during the time that Rob, now crowned King in the North, has gone south with his army, and Bran has to preside as Prince of Winterfell in the official capacity as Northern Lords arrive at Winterfell for the feast. Before the feast day, however, Bran has to sit as Prince while the Northern Lords come to discuss important matters of the realm, and even then the Green Man Summer Prince symbolism begins. Bran is carried to the audience chamber by Hodor in the wicker basket that I alluded to in a previous video. Hodor hummed tunelessly as he went down hand under hand, Bran bouncing against his back in the wicker seat that Maester Lewin had fashioned for him. Lewin had gotten the idea from the baskets the women used to carry firewood on their backs. After that, it had been a simple matter of cutting leg holes and attaching some new straps to spread Bran's weight more evenly. 
The Wicker Man is a variant of the Green Man, speaking in a general sense, and the Wicker Man folklore has to do with the turning of the seasons, sacrificing to bring a good harvest, and other such witchy goodness. In particular, the Wicker Man is burned in the springtime, and because of Julius Caesar's scurrilous spreading of rumors, because of his vile calumny about the Druids, it was long believed that human sacrifices were actually placed inside the Wicker Man before it was burned. Though again, there is no other evidence to corroborate this. In any case, Bran being placed inside a firewood basket made of wicker is clear and consistent foreshadowing of Bran's green man status as well as his potential burning, although again, we don't know if that's metaphorical or literal, and that's a topic that we'll get into more as this series goes along. For now, the takeaway is that Bran is heavily implied as a green man who will sacrifice himself, in some sense, to turn the seasons. The Summer King is traditionally sacrificed in the autumn and rises again in the spring, and this is the Autumn Harvest Feast, so... Now when Bran arrives at the audience chamber, he's placed in his father's oak chair with the gray velvet cushions, reinforcing Bran's role as an Oak King or a Summer King. The Maesters have just proclaimed it the first of autumn, and most of the talk Bran attends to here is discussion of the harvest and storing away food for the winter. So again, everything is thematic. It's very harvest feasty. At the end of the second day of playing Lord, Bran has a few hours left to visit with Summer in the Gonswood, and George foreshadows his eventual Summer King-like reemergence from Bloodraven's cave. No sooner had Hodor entered the Gonswood than Summer emerged from under an oak, almost as if he had known they were coming. Summer is emerging from beneath an oak. It's the return of the Oak King and of Summer itself. And it's coming from beneath a tree, of course. It's nice that George drops this more hopeful foreshadowing in during the Harvest Feast chapter, just to remind us that Bran's sacrificial symbolism is only one stop on his journey, and that the sacrifices he and his friends make will be for a worthy cause. Summer will come again, in other words, and it will be thanks in large part to Bran the Summer King and all those who helped make him the three-eyed raven that he will someday become. Did I mention sacrificial symbolism? How about this dream that comes a couple pages after the last quote? On this night he dreamed of the weirwood. It was looking at him with its deep red eyes, calling to him with its twisted wooden mouth. And from its pale branches the three-eyed crow came flapping, pecking at his face and crying his name in a voice as sharp as swords. This is also the implication of the three-eyed crow always asking Bran for corn. Bran is being asked for his seed for his life and vitality, for his very self. Bran, after all, is a cereal grain, so asking Bran for corn is the next best thing to asking Bran for himself. Of course, Martin also seems to be riffing on the phrase Corn King, a more modern expression to characterize all the green nature gods who die and resurrect to depict the cycle of the seasons. The Green Man is a Corn King, Garth would be a Corn King, Osiris is a Corn King, and so on. Martin is just hitting different notes in the same song here, and this is the song from the wood. In this last quote, the three-eyed crow flies from the weirwood's branches to attack Bran with its sword-like voice, implying Bran's giving of himself to the tree, as he eventually does in Bloodraven's cave. And the ever-silent weirwood is even calling to Bran here, the only time we ever read of any sort of sound emerging from a weirwood mouth, except for the black gate, which does talk. When the day of the harvest feast arrives, we see that Bran is mounted on Dancer, his horse, getting set to enter the feast hall. Sir Roderick has been unyielding in his refusal to allow Bran's wolf to enter with him. This is the harvest feast, marking the end of summer, so of course Bran can't bring his wolf's summer with him. Very funny. As Bran enters the great hall on Dancer, the guests rise and cry out Stark and Winterfell, and we read, He was old enough to know that it was not truly him they shouted for. It was the harvest they cheered. It was Rob and his victories. It was his lord father and his grandfather and all the Starks going back 8,000 years. Still, it made him swell with pride. It wasn't Bran they cheered for, but the harvest. But Bran represents the harvest, as a dying green man always does. He must give his own corn up for the people, that they might eat. Bran is also representing the entire Stark heritage, which is that of green seer kings, warg kings, and most of all, sacrificing oneself to end the long winter. Bran is once again placed in his father's high seat, the oaken one, and speaks the ritual words of the harvest feast. He bid them welcome in the name of his brother, the king of the north, and asked them to thank the old gods and new for Rob's victories and the bounty of the harvest. He finishes by saying, 
May there be a hundred more, thereby offering his princely green man blessing. This done, he drinks the ritualistic glass of summer wine with all of its blood-drinking implications, and as its hot, snaky fingers wiggle through Bran's chest, we think of the very last words of the very last Bran chapter in A Dance with Dragons, which brings us his last weirwood vision. No, said Bran, no, don't! But they could not hear him, no more than his father had. The woman grabbed the captive by the hair, hooked the sickle round his throat, and slashed. And through the mist of centuries, the broken boy could only watch as the man's feet drummed against the earth. But as his life flowed out of him in a red tide, Brandon Stark could taste the blood. Bran's A Dance with Dragons chapters amount to a crash course on what it means to be a green seer, and represent Bran facing his own fears and embracing his destiny head on. George chooses to end his A Dance with Dragons chapters with this vision, and not just to be creepy. He's showing us that at its core, this green seer stuff is blood magic. It's about ritual sacrifice, symbolic and even real cannibalism, and the most primal nature magic. Recall the darker side of the Garth the Green myth. A few of the very oldest tales of Garth Greenhand present us with a considerably darker deity, one who demanded blood sacrifice from his worshippers to ensure a bountiful harvest. In some stories, the green god dies every autumn when the trees lose their leaves, only to be reborn with the coming of spring. Bran has a bit of both going on at the harvest feast. He's the symbolic sacrificial summer king, but he's also the one ensuring bountiful harvests for the future through his benedictions and drinking the offered wine which stands in for blood. Bran's ultimate destiny is to wed the tree and become a green seer king, and so his weird dream of drinking the blood offered to the tree juxtaposes well with drinking the summer wine at the harvest feast. Speaking of juxtaposition, that's a segue, while Bran sits in his father's oak chair and drinks more of the spiced summer wine from his father's silver direwolf goblet, he recalls the last time he had seen his father drink from it. It had been the night of the welcoming feast when King Robert had brought his court to Winterfell. Summer still reigned then. His parents had shared the dais with Robert and his queen, with her brothers beside her. Bran goes on to recall all the people who had been alive back when summer still reigned, all of whom are now gone. You can see how Summer and King Robert are treated interchangeably here, as Summer is said to have reigned when Robert did, which it did. Robert died just before the end of Summer, and Bran now commemorates his death in memory here at the feast that marks Summer's end, all while performing the green man duties himself. During the feast, Bran actually does tap into his green seer powers, having an unprompted and unexpected waking dream where he momentarily skin changes Summer in the godswood. When he comes back, it says that the waking dream had been so vivid for a moment Bran had not known where he was. That's a nice overlay of drinking the symbolic wine blood and tapping into the powers of the old gods, here at the harvest feast as Bran sits in the oaken seat of his father and his father's father. Again, this makes us think of Bran, sitting on his weirwood throne in Bloodraven's cave and drinking the blood of an ancient human sacrifice through the Winterfell heart tree, the very same heart tree that he just visited during his waking dream from the dais after drinking the summer wine. This entire chapter spells out Bran's very Garth-like, weirwood king role, as well as the importance that the cycle of the seasons plays in Bran's arc in particular. This Harvest Feast chapter also features the arrival of the beloved Jojen and Mira Reed, and the little ritual they play out again spells out Bran's Garth-like, nature god role. My lords of Stark, the girl said, the years have passed in their hundreds and their thousands since my folk first swore their fealty to the king in the north. My lord father has sent us here to say the words again for all our people. She's looking at me, Bran realized. He had to make some answer. My brother Rob is fighting in the south, he said but you can say your words to me if you like. To Winterfell we pledge the faith of Greywater, they said together. Hearth and heart and harvest we yield up to you, my lord. Our swords and spears and arrows are yours to command. Grant mercy to our weak, help to our helpless, and justice to all, and we shall never fail you. I swear it by earth and water, said the boy in green. I swear it by bronze and iron, his sister said. We swear it by ice and fire, they finished together. Bran groped for words. Was he supposed to swear something back to them? Their oath was not one he had been taught. May your winters be short and your summers bountiful, he said. That was usually a good thing to say. Rise, I'm Brandon Stark. Now look, I know it seems like I pull very long quotes from the book sometimes, but that's because some of these passages really are just so loaded with import that summarizing them would actually take longer. Anyway, this quote really is great. 
First off, we have the basic ritual of Bran's subjects offering up a portion of their harvest to him in return for a blessing of a bountiful summer, with extra points to the reeds for including the eponymous ice and fire phraseology. Second of all, Jojen and Mira are specifically making a reference to the last Marsh King of the Cranog Man and his defeat at the hands of Rickard Stark, who was either a king in the north or a king of winter, doesn't say. As we mentioned last time, the Marsh Kings were often Green Seer Kings, and King Rickard took the daughter of the one that he defeated as a wife, thus ensuring the submission of the Cranog Men to Winterfell. That's what Jojen and Mira are talking about when they say, The years have passed in their hundreds and their thousands since my folk first swore their fealty to the King of the North, and when they renew their promise that our swords and spears and arrows are yours to command. I just love how all of this sets up Bran as a Green Seer King and a Warg King, who is ready to go to battle with his Green Seers and beasts, as the original Warg King did. The first thing Jojen and Mira ask about after their greeting ritual is the Direwolves. The chapter ends with Bran slipping into the wolf dream and meeting Jojen and Mira in the godswood as a wolf. And of course, it is Jojen and Mira who shepherd Bran to Bloodraven's cave and his Green Seer King destiny. Even Bran's very young, sort of crush on Mira reenacts history in that it mimics the daughter of the Marsh King who married a Stark King. So even though all the players here are very young, one does get a sense of George getting the band back together from the Age of Heroes in this scene, which is both endlessly cool and clear foreshadowing of Bran as a Stark Greenseer King. Now there are two very nice symbolic clues that Bran's journey as a fallen and then risen Summer King is tied to his classic struggle against the others. The first one is one of my very favorites, if only for the sake of those drunken, lovable umbers. Much later, after all the sweets had been served and washed down with gallons of summer wine, the food was cleared and the tables shoved back against the walls to make room for the dancing. The music grew wilder, the drummers joined in, and Hothar Umber brought forth a huge curved warhorn banded in silver. When the singer reached the part in The Night That Ended, where the Night's Watch rode forth to meet the others in the battle for the dawn, he blew a blast that set all the dogs to barking. That seems pretty straightforward. Martin is evoking the defeat of the others, the battle for the dawn, and the end of the long night, all right smack dab in the middle of the harvest feast that spells out Bran as a green seer king and a summer king, and which features him getting tipsy on summer wine and warging out accidentally in the oaken seat of the Starks. Very cool. Next, we have the moment of Bran's falling asleep at the end of the chapter, where George somewhat randomly inserts talk of flaming star swords and dawn before Bran jumps to the godswood. When he blew out his bedside candle, darkness covered him like a soft, familiar blanket. The faint sound of music drifted through his shuttered window. Something his father had told him once when he was little came back to him suddenly. He had asked Lord Eddard if the Kingsguard were truly the finest knights in the Seven Kingdoms. No longer, he answered, but once they were a marvel, a shining lesson to the world. Was there one who was best of all? The finest knight I ever saw was Sir Arthur Dane, who fought with a blade called Dawn, forged from the heart of a fallen star. They called him the Sword of the Morning, and he would have killed me but for Howland Reed. Father had gotten sad then, and he would say no more. Bran wished he had asked him what he meant. He went to sleep with his head full of knights in gleaming armor, fighting with swords that shone like starfire. But when the dream came, he was in the godswood again. The smells from the kitchen and the great hall were so strong that it was almost as if he had never left the feast. He prowled beneath the trees, his brother close behind him. Quite honestly, this sounds a lot like foreshadowing of the Battle of Winterfell against the others that we saw on TV and that we'll get some version of in the books. Bran is dreaming in the godswood, knights are fighting with fiery star swords, and the direwolves are prowling beneath the trees. On top of that, the fight at the Tower of Joy between Eddard and his group of seven and the three Kingsguard knights that Bran references here is actually a scene which mimics an important part of the War for the Dawn, with Ned as a stark last hero figure and the snow-white armored Kingsguard playing the role of the others. I've talked about that extensively in the Moons of Ice and Fire podcast series, if you're curious. But for now, the basic point is that the Tower of Joy reference works to enhance the last battle vibe of this scene, and quite possibly to insert the idea of flaming swords into the godswood along with Bran warging into his direwolf. It's very similar to that opening scene in the Winterfell godswood where Ned slowly and lustily polished his huge dragon sword while discussing the others and the direwolves with Catelyn. Once again, George is spelling out the primary elements of the final showdown in the place where it will occur. 
In that first Winterfell scene, the message seemed very basic. The others are coming, and the Starks, specifically Ned and Lyanna's children, will need to be there with dragon swords and dire wolves when they do. This time, the emphasis is on Bran and his role as the eventual Summer King of Westeros, who will rise not only to help defeat the others and make the season's turn once again, but also to reign over a new summer that, let's face it, anyone who survives this story richly deserves. Hopefully, Bran won't be too drunk on summer wine when the time comes. Just enough to warg out a bit. All right, everyone, we hope you've enjoyed the second installment in our King Bran series, and if you did, good news, part three is already written, and it will be coming your way soon. Thanks to everyone who leaves a comment or shares this video, it really helps. And thanks most of all to our Patreon community, which you can check out at luciferMeansLightbringer.com. Until next time.